watching and taking notes. So hopefully they don't get the bright idea that if you're in the Institute, they're going to have you get up and say something or, or deliver a message. I don't know. I don't know how, how far that's going to go. But it's good to be with you. It's also good to have our visitors. Thanks for coming out. Make yourself right at home. We are down home. Uh, don't let the suit and ties fool you. And we wear them just for the tourists. That's when they come in and look, you know, they think you should have a suit and tie on. But if you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me to Job, Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. We're going to look at the life. Uh, most of us setting here know something of Job. It's a fam famous passage or book in the Bible. Uh, it is said uh, by most theologians that it's one of the oldest books that, uh, that we have that compiles in the, the Old Testament, one of the oldest books written. And so we're, we're going to look at uh, the life of a man. We're going to look at his life. And so if I've titled this, a, a Life Like Job. A life like Job. The Bible speaks of a few men that if righteousness, if man could, could produce his own righteousness and save himself and get into heaven, he names three people, but not even them, they could do it. And one of those men was Job. And we're going to read about that and, and see why that not even his righteousness, uh, as, as the type of man that Job was, not even his righteousness could save him from hell. And uh, no, that's, we're not going to be on hell tonight, but we're going to look at the life, a life like Job. And I want to challenge each one of us tonight, uh, where, where is our life? I know we're Christians. Most of us here tonight probably are saved by God's grace. And if you're not, hopefully you will get soon. But uh, most of us know Jesus Christ. We have a life. We're Christians. We enjoy being called a Christian. We enjoy coming to church. You're here tonight for Wednesday evening. And uh, so we can be challenged by the life, we're going to look at six areas in his life, just on the first few verses here in Job chapter 1. If you found your place, we'll begin reading in verse 1, Job chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters." His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses. Man, you imagine having all that. Today's, in today's realm, that would be a lot. That would be a lot of stuff, a lot of cars, a lot of, a lot of stuff going on here. Back then, this is how they viewed wealth or successful uh, in the terms of a carnal sense of what you owned. And here you can tell quickly that uh, Job was a wealthy man. He had had great success or God had blessed him. And I think that's what it was here as we read on down. But notice with me now to finish that verse so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. So he was very great, one of the greatest. Verse 4, and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And when it was so, when the days of their fa the feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, <coughs> and rose up early in the morning, and offered bur burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, this did Job continually. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you, and I thank you for this opportunity to uh, open your word. And Father, to preach just for a few moments, uh, uh, Father, on the man named Job, and Father, his life, and how you worked, and uh, what took place in this guy's life that we can take and we can use, and Father, in our lives today, so many years, so many centuries, on into the future, Father, here we sat uh, reading your word and, and watching actually how, uh, Father, this man run his life or led his life in accordance to you. Now be with our lives, be with those that have showed up tonight, be with the prayer petition that we've brought up before you and those that need prayer. Father, those that are weak, uh, those that are facing surgery or had surgery, we lift them up again before you that we continually continue to pray for them for strength, for healing, and Father, that you would be involved in what you have going on in those certain persons' lives. So Father, be with those that have come out again, suit a blessing. 
Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Strike anything uh, that I shouldn't say from my lips and from my thoughts, but use me as a vessel tonight. And Father, we ask all this in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Here in Job, just in a few verses, we find <coughs> that this man was a great man. But uh, some of the things that we first look at here in this is what kind of a life he had, how he, uh, how he structured his life, and the Bible records it as such. Now, if, you, if we were to read on in this chapter, verse 6 and so on, we would see that he is going to face a trial. And he's going to face a trial that probably some have never even experienced uh, un, unlike what Job actually goes through. And you can read the whole book of Job. Uh, I even scanned through some of it and uh, looked at it and then have some verses we'll look at in the end. But uh, this man went through some great trials. But here in the first part, it brings out some things that I think are important to you and I, to our lives. So how should we live this Christian life? What are some of the things that you and I can do to have a good relationship or a life that is pleasing to God? Uh, now, notice that our Bible here, we believe the Bible is inspired and written of God, ultimately the, the author of scriptures. And so here he has it recorded as such. And so we're going to look number one. Uh, and as we examine ourselves, as we look at this text, uh, we need a, a life like Job's. So we ask ourselves, what type of life do we have? And so let's look at, look at this life. I believe there's uh, six areas here that are mentioned that I think are worth mentioning and taking into each one of our lives as Christians. Number one, we see in verse number one, he was perfect. The Bible records that Job was perfect. Now watch this. Uh, there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, it says. And so you say, well, there's none righteous because you just told us that even Job's righteousness couldn't save himself from hell. And that is true. Even the righteousness as perfect as a man might get in this, in this life, he still has human nature. Job still got old and Job still died. And uh, as we taught earlier in chapel today, that death, sad to say, death is the proof that there is something wrong with humanity, with men, with man, you might say. Uh, and so you say, what is that? What is wrong with man? Well, that's why we go back to the garden. What happened? What caused a human uh, that God had created perfect and said that was good? The Bible even records that man is the jewel crown of God's creation. So what happened? Did God create us to die? No, He didn't. That wasn't His original plan. Because of sin, because of one sin, one disobedience, the human race was plunged into, into, if you please, a death. And so that's why we're, if you please, and I've said it here before, we're living on a graveyard. And so here, Job was not perfect as in such that he was sinlessly perfect. But God records this in such a way, and the Bible uses this word quite often, and it speaks of a maturity. It speaks of somebody who has stability in their life. Here, Job knew God. Uh, here, God, Job prayed to God. And we're going to see this, and Job worshiped God in such a way that God used this word perfect. He was mature, if you please, spiritually. We could ask the question, where is our maturity at as Christians uh, that we live in today's age? We live in a wicked time. Just turn the news off for a couple of minutes or watch some, uh, some television or read a newspaper. You're going to find that uh, not everybody is out to do everybody good. <laughs> uh, it's, that's by a long shot. Here, Job, he lived in, in, in such a time, but it doesn't say much about that. Here it speaks of his spirituality. Listen, if Job is able to live a mature spiritual life in his day and age, not having a completed Bible, not maybe quite having a church to go to as we do, we can, we can also live as mature Christians, spiritually speaking. So the Bible records Job's life as he was a perfect man, and it says an upright and upright. Now we see something here. This speaks of his mature spiritually, and he lived a pure, upright life. Uh, we speak of that today. We believe in separation, and today uh, you don't need much separation for the world to look at and say, man, you got a lot of separation. The world is so far gone for morality and ethics 
it's, it's a shame to even speak of it because it's defilement and it uses uh, certain words that shouldn't be mentioned and a mixed multitude. But this is the world and society that we live in. You say, can we live upright? Can we live a pure life in today's age? Well, the Bible says that we can. The Bible says that God has equipped us with the tools and the instruments, if you please, the armament that the Bible speaks of, that we are able. We are able and well able. And so here we see point number one, he was a perfect man. Speaks of his spiritual maturity and his life in front of other people. And God records it recorded it as such. So we read on in verse number one, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. We see number one, he practiced fearing God. Uh, This has been far removed from even Christianity of today, even in the conservative circles, uh, fearing God. Uh, Most of what's taught today is more of a reverential fear or respect for God than actually a fear of God. You know, God, our life consists, it's in the palm of His hand. Uh, The air we breathe, you and I, the food we eat, uh, the places that we go, the things we enjoy ourselves that we take for granted, all come from God. Uh, They consist out of the power of God. God like that could uh, flip a switch and nod, whatever He wants to do, and we wouldn't exist any farther. God is all-powerful. Here, we see that Job, one of the principles and one of the facts about his life, not only was he a perfect man, a spiritually mature man, he practiced fearing God. And you say, well, how can I live a good uh, spiritual life as a Christian? Number one, uh, we could practice fearing God uh, more than we do because our life consists uh, of the power of God. It's in his hands. So he excused evil. Uh, he did away with evil. He didn't want nothing to do with evil. He didn't rub up against evil. He didn't step on it sometimes. He didn't hold hands with evil uh, that was going on during the day. He excused, he, it was out of his mind. Uh, and uh, I keep thinking of chapel. Most of our students, some of our students are here tonight. We said earlier to this morning in chapel, school chapel, uh, that you need to immediately go on the attack when you have an evil thought that enters your mind. You need to immediately strike it down. So the attitude that you have towards evil, towards sin, towards things that aren't of God, you need to be able to strike down immediately. And generally that stuff starts in the mind. Here uh, we see that this man, Job, He practiced fearing God. He excused evil. That's the definition to fearing God. You don't want nothing to do with evil. Uh, And so here we see, and we'll read on as we uh, move on. Number two, look at verse number two with me. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance uh, also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. Drop down with me to verse number five. And uh, we'll get into our next point. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early and rose up early in the morning. This spoke, and I needed another P because we're working on the literated side of things tonight. Uh, so uh, you say, well, what, what would you place here? He placed God first. You know, this is important in a Christian life. Uh, This is so important. A lot of times we get up, and I'm going to speak of myself. I'm going to run through my morning routine. I get up. uh, First thing I like is uh, drink some water, go to the bathroom, make some coffee, and uh, and then uh, look at the news, look at the weather. And then if I got time, I pull the Bible out and begin to read and pray, if I have time. And you say, wow, okay. And sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it waits all the way to the end of the day before I go to bed and say, I haven't haven't prayed. (laughs) I've got through the day and I'm still alive. I'm laying in my own bed and God hadn't struck me dead or something bad hadn't happened to me. And I haven't even prayed, maybe over some food for lunch, maybe breakfast or supper. But I haven't prayed to God, the God who is holding my salvation, the God who saved me by his grace, the God who's given me the air to breathe and to work that day safely, uh, the God that's given me my family, my life, everything that consists of my little bubbled world. And I hadn't thanked him. So prayer needs to come in. You know, Job, notice what he did here. He says that uh, in verse 5, he says, And he rose up early in the morning. Listen, it's important to put God first. We speak of of practical order in your life. Where is God at in your priority list? Uh, Do you give him the leftovers of your life? You know, sad to say in my life, a lot of times he gets just leftover time that I end up having before I pillow my head at night. 
and he should get the first part of it. When your mind's fresh, when your heart's open, when you first wake up, this is what Job was putting forth. You say, looking at the life of Job, can I use this? Listen, this is good stuff. What about waking up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all? And so here Job was praying for his children, every one of them. And his burnt offerings, the Bible speaks of our prayers being sweet-smelling savers as burnt offering up before the Lord. Your prayers go up before the Lord, and he hears every one of them. And he ponders every one of them. And he ponders the heart that the prayers come through. And here, uh, here you see that this man, Job, he was practicing fearing God. He was perfect. He was mature in his spiritual life. He excused evil. He did away with evil. He didn't want evil nowhere near him. And he placed God first. You find this in people who have placed God first. They have a fear for God, and they don't like evil. They like the Word of God. They like the things of God. They like the work of God. And so here you say, can we put this in our life? We can. We most certainly can. Just by say, simply taking heed there into the word or the preaching of the word of God. So we see here that Job, uh, he placed God first early in the morning. That's the, that's the best place to put God. <laughs> early, early in the morning. Early in the morning. We uh, challenge our young folks in our, in our school uh, to, to accept Christ early in their life. Listen, as you get older, you get mindset. Uh, you get mind trapped. And the older and older you get, the more you uh, have a tendency to reject the, the Word of God, the preaching, the teaching of God. As He lays out that free gift of salvation, it might become colder and colder to you as you grow older. And it's hard. And it's a rare thing to see an older person come to know Christ. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible, but it gets harder. And harder. So the younger you are, the more open you are to the word and to truth. And so it's important here, here Job was putting God first in his day, early in the morning. But there's something else I want you to notice that we can use in our life, a life like Job's. Uh, is our life like Job's? Uh, I begin to be, become ashamed of how this man was written and to look at my life. And here you're supposed to be some type of role model. You know everybody's watching you. Every one of us, there's somebody that's watching you and how you live your Christian life. It might be a family member. It might be a spouse. It might be children that look up to you in some way. But somebody's watching. Here, Job, Job put God first and it was early in the morning. But notice something else here. Now, if we look closely at this and examine this verse, let's read on and see actually how, he, how, how this unfolds. So we begin to pray and offer burnt offerings in verse 5. Notice with me, and it says, according to the number of them all. For Job said it may be. Now listen, this guy's banking on the possibility he didn't know for sure whether his, his sons had done this or his daughters had uh, cursed God. But he says, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. You see what this speak, speak of? This speaks of his persistence. He was very persistent in his prayer. Uh, he said it, he did this continually. You know, um, it's easy to use God in our lives as a spare tire. You know, when the chips are down, you're laying in the hospital bed, or your, your child's sick, all of a sudden, boom, let's pray. Well, Job wasn't that type of a prayer warrior. It says that he did this continually, even when everything was going fine. And his thought was, his thought was, let's err to the side of right instead of the side of wrong. He says, it may be that my sons have sinned, just maybe, and, and curse God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Means he did it daily, day in and day out, whether he thought it was so or not. But he was persistent. He did it continually. You know, we could use some persistence in our life, in my Christian life. We can use some continually prayer, continue uh, offering up of our sins to God. And uh, having him clean our lives daily on a continual basis. Here, Job was praying for his children. And you think, wow, that's something else. You know, I, I, I have children. I have five children. I uh, daily pray for my children. Uh, I don't just pray for their day and their, and their safety, but I pray for their spouses. I don't know who that is. I have no idea. But I know one day, 
<laughs> Some of you have already been there, done that, and have the t-shirt for I know one day they're going to meet Mr. Wonderful or uh, Mrs. Wonderful, and you want that to be the right person, the person that God has, that God has ordained or ordered into that person's life. And so we want the best. And so here, this is, Job was praying for his children, and they probably were already married and gone on, but here he did this for his children continually. It speaks of his persistence. We need some persistence in our, in our Christian life, a life like Job's. Do we have a life like Job? Sad to say, a lot of us do not. And then we wonder why all the wrong, why all the unanswered prayer, why the non-blessings. It's because we try to skip through life living off what little grace we get from God and in none giving Him glory or honor or persistence in our Christian life for Him. Uh, God, God is a jealous God. Uh, he wants to be worshipped. Here, we got another point here. Now, this is, we're going to step away from this chapter one here. I, I want to know, and I needed another P, and I'm, I think I have this word right. He kept his probity. And you say, what is that? I had to look it up. I was doing some study. I needed another P in that six point. Look with me in chapter two. Uh, probity speaks of his integrity. Now notice with me in verse 9, and your, your students can look this word up and uh, give me a check, a double check on that. I like doing that for them, and then sure enough, if I'm wrong, they'll let me know for sure, but probity, uh, it's P-R-O-B-I-T-Y. Uh, he kept his probity. Look at chapter 2 and verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity and curse God and die? Now you have to understand what unfolded from verse 5, from verse 6 on into chapter 2, is that there was, well, if you please, a contest between God and Satan. And Satan comes to, 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 to show himself before God with the sons of God. And, uh, and he says, hey, whence comest thou? And Satan says, coming to and fro in the earth. And so he gave him a kind of slight report there. And, and so God says, hast thou considered my servant Job? And uh, Satan says, yeah, I, yeah, he's, you blessed him. You've got a hedge about him. Uh, you bless him, and so he worships you because you bless him. You've given him everything. You take everything that he has, and he'll curse you to his face, you to your face. And he says, okay, all that thou have, you can touch, but don't take his life. And so begins the contest. And Job's kind of left with what's going on. Job doesn't know this. Matter of fact, I'm not even sure if Job wrote this book. I don't know. But Job could have died. I know he died full of age, but he still could have died not knowing what had taken place because God never gave him, God never gave him a, a, a reason what, with what happened to his life. God didn't come uh, to Job and said, oh, yeah, by the way, Satan showed up. And Satan said, yeah, yeah, I've looked at your servant over there. And uh, yeah, if you, you, he's blessing you and he's worshiping you because you have given him everything that he's asked for. You take everything that he has and he's going to curse you. Uh, God didn't do that to Job. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, Job waits 37 chapters into Job looking for an answer from God. And it's amazing what you find out what the answer was. And we'll, we'll look at that here just in a second. But his, his integrity, his probity, if you please, he kept his integrity. Look at verse 10. But he said unto her, and this is his wife. This is his wife, and I believe it's speaking of her integrity. Now listen to this. His wife says, look, dost thou still retain thine integrity, was the question she asked. She says, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, that was normally not what she said. Watch this, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. So he said, Look, you're speaking like one of the foolish women speaketh. She didn't normally speak like this, but what had taken place in his life and her life, she was, she was on that, that edge. So watch this. He says, What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Now watch what it says and records about Job here in verse 10. 10, if you please. <clears throat> he says, in all this did not Job sin with his lips. Listen, Job was able to keep his integrity. Now, I've titled it probity for the P uh, for our literated purposes. But here, Job finally realized, listen, later on, 37 chapters later, that what the answer was to what happened was all he needed was God was his answer. God was in control, and that was the most important thing that Job needed to know is that God was in control. God was all-powerful. And so you see, as you end up in verse 42, notice with me. Let's turn over there just for the fun of it. we got some time here. I know we have a men's meeting in, uh, in a little bit, but notice with me in Job chapter 42. 
and we're going to summarize this up. The life of Job. How is our life? How is your life? Is it Job-like? Is it Job-like? Hopefully it is. Uh, Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. Notice some things here just about Job. Notice uh, in, four, in chapter 42, look at verses 4. This is God speaking. Uh, and he said, well, this is Job. But he says here, here I beseech thee, verse 4, and I will speak, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Here God had had been asking him question after question, dost thou, knowest thou not, uh, doest thou? And he's asking these, these questions after question to Job. Job didn't have any answers. And so here he says he began to, to see this thing. And in Job 42 and 42.10, drop down there with me, verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Listen, he was in captivity of Satan and God turned his captivity. But Job never got a full conclusion on why it happened. All you come to realize after reading and pondering and, and taking the sense of the verses is that God, God was his answer. God was in control. He doesn't have to give you a, a reason or an excuse why he does what he does. God is in control. And so Job realized this, and you'll see this in this chapter as it concludes, and we look at the conclusion. Now with the conclusion of our message tonight, is your life Job-like? Uh, that's the question I want to, to put to you and put to myself. Is your life Job-like? Listen, he had some pretty important things. He was perfect. Uh, he was uh, mature, mature in, in, in spirituality. And, uh, and, and in his life, he was pure and upright, the Bible says. And he practiced fearing God. He placed God first in his life, in his order. And his priority list, you might say. He prayed for his children, and he was very persistent at that. And he kept his probity, his integrity was still intact. Even though when Satan attacked him, uh, he could have cursed God and God could have took him on. But he didn't. He did not charge God. And the Bible says he did not sin in this. And so our conclusion is, is our life Job-like? I know mine was. And after reading that, just the first five verses was convicting. And there was some changing that can be taking place in our life. Uh, but are you happy with just the God as the answer in your life? You're going to go through some storms. You're going to go through, go through some tragedy and some things that God's going to take you through. And you're not going to know why God's taking you through that. You're not going to know all of what God has in the background going on as such as with Job. But the most important thing is the question or the answer is God's in control. Some things we'll never know. Some things that go on that you think, how could God let this happen? And then you go and you look at the verse, the sweet verse that says God's perfect. God doesn't do anything wrong. And our little finite mind fights and struggles, but you know it's still a finite mind. It's not an infinite mind that we have. Uh, we only work on time limits and time scales and what our mind can compute and to, uh, to accurately use. God's mind is infinite. So that's why the Bible, when it says he, does, he doesn't do anything wrong, he's perfect. Man, he never, he never told Job what happened. Not that it's recorded here. He just said, I'm God, I'm in control. And sometimes we have to live with that answer. Listen, let me ask you, can you live with that answer? Ultimate answer is, are you happy with God? Let's all stand tonight. Hopefully you are. Hopefully you're saved in here this evening. Listen, Job knew his Redeemer. It's recorded that he says, I know my Redeemer. Uh, it, Job trusted in God. Job was not a dumb man. Job was not an ignorant man. A fool, the Bible says, says in his heart that there is no God. You say, what if you run across somebody who does not believe in God and the Bible and church and all this? Does it make it not effect? It doesn't. It's still here. The Word of God's still here. It's still going to happen. Uh, God gives you a will to choose. As I said this morning in chapel, you don't step into hell. You don't step into hell not knowing you step into hell as an intruder. God never made hell for you and I. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. And so he sent his son to die on the cross to make a way, a sacrifice, because God 
needed and wanted and has stated that he needs a sacrifice. So his son said, I'll go. I'll go. So today, that is what is hinged on the cross is Jesus Christ's work. Finished work, completed. That's what we trust in. Don't, don't slip into eternity in a foolish state. A foolish state says, I've got time. If you listen to the prayer petition tonight, there's people who would never thought they would be where they are tonight. Two days ago, one day ago, two weeks ago. You don't know what life's going to bring you. So don't slip into eternity, have never accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Pastor.